Welcome everyone to Skype with Scientists, no time like the presentation. We are gathered here today to hear five 10 minute presentations from graduate students and postdocs who previously submitted 90 second descriptions of their work. And so um, myself and seven other people that include scientists and people who have nothing to do with science watched those videos and picked the 10 that were the most engaging and easy to understand. And so those scientists today are gonna to be giving talks. And so we're super excited that you're all here with us today. Um, and I'm excited to hear all of these presentations. And so uh, we're gonna be starting with uh, Chris Baker. So um, before I get started, you are welcome to ask questions at the end of each session. If you have questions throughout uh, the presentations, please feel free to write them in the Q&A. Please be respectful of the Q&A because a human needs to uh, read them. And so uh, at the end of each presentation, we'll have a minute and a half to answer questions and then we'll move on to the next person so this all fits nice and neat within one hour. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, Skype a Scientist. We um, are a 501c3. We support uh, scientists communicating their work and help people connect with science all over the world. We serve um, generally about 10,000 classrooms a year, although this year we've already uh, broken 6,000 classrooms, uh, matched them up with scientists. We do events like live streams like this and also Q&A sessions with specific scientists that last about 45 minutes. We also do trivia events on Thursday nights for adults. And we're generally just trying to make science as engaging um, for everyone all the time, whether there is a pandemic on or not. Okay, so I will, oh, and you can donate to our program at paypal.me slash Skype a Scientist or become a patron at patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist. We are totally donor supported. And so anything you can do to help us is really, really appreciated. So I am going to hide myself because I am not the star of the show today. The scientists are. So let's bring out uh, Chris Baker. All right. I'm going to share my screen too because I have a couple of slides I'd like to show people. Perfect. Um, All right, let, let me put that away for a second. All right, so thanks, Sarah. This, this is a great opportunity. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And um, so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk about a bit of work that I've been doing over the past couple of years using DNA from blood feeding leeches to measure animal biodiversity. So let's get the obvious question out of the way first, which is why on earth would we do that? So measuring biodiversity is critical to conservation, but it turns out that it's really hard to do on a large scale, right? So if you want to conserve wild animals, for example, you need to know things like what animals are present, you need to know where they are, and you need to know how their numbers are changing over time. But the problem is that measuring these things using traditional approaches can be pretty costly. So if you think about how you might go about measuring biodiversity using traditional methods, you know, you might go out into the field and make records of all the animals that you can see or hear, or you might trap animals, you might track them. And these approaches are great, right? But they often involve a lot of people. And depending on what it is that you want to do, the, those people are going to need anywhere from like some to a lot of training. Another approach is to use technology, right? So you could go out and you could put out camera traps like this little device that I'm showing you in the bottom left of the screen here. Um, and th that camera trap just takes a photograph anytime that like a, an animal wanders across in, in, in front of it. Or you might use an, an acoustic recorder like this one down here in the bottom right of the, of the screen. And these, these approaches are also great, right? But this equipment costs money and it takes people to put them out into the field. Um, and you, you've got to deal with the data when, it, when, when, when uh, the data come back. So there are drawbacks to these things. And, and the upshot of all of this is that it means that comprehensive biodiversity surveys are often just not done. So in our project, we wanted to measure the animal biodiversity in the Ailashan Nature Reserve in the southern China. We wanted to know how well is this nature reserve conserving its wild animal populations. So this nature reserve, it's kind of like a weird national park. It, it's, it's long and it's thin. You can see it running along the top of a ridge line there. And it's surrounded by agricultural land in all directions. Right? 
but the other thing that you'll see in that slide is that it's long, like it's 80 miles from one end to the other, right? It's 265 square miles. And if you want to survey all the animals in that park, that's a lot of ground to cover. And so we wanted to know whether we could do this by using DNA from blood feeding leeches. So I'm sure that many of you have come across leeches yourselves. You know, there are lots of different kinds of leech. Some of them live in the water, some of them live on the land. Maybe you've gone hiking and you pulled off your boots and your socks to find some of these creatures attached to your feet. Well, they're there because they're feeding on your blood, right? And the fact that they're feeding on animal blood allows, them, allows us to use them in our research. So the idea is this. Imagine you've got an animal at the field site, something like this bobcat maybe. If a leech feeds on that bobcat, then now the animal's blood is inside the gut of the leech, right? And if we can capture that leech, we can get the animal blood out of the leech, we can sequence the animal's DNA, and then we can use our DNA sequences. We can look them up in a database and say, oh, like this was a bobcat that we saw at our site, right? And because we know where the leech was collected, we know exactly where that bobcat was at our site, right? So we can tell what animals are at our field site without ever having to see the animal itself, right? This is exactly the same kind of thing as when, you know, like in your favorite crime show, police use DNA to, to identify a human suspect. Like we're doing exactly the same thing, except instead of identifying human subjects, we're identifying animal species. You don't have to sequence the whole genome or anything like that, because scientists have worked out short gene sequences that are really good for telling different animals apart. So we just sequence those those little bits. And for us, they work a little bit like the kind of barcodes that you find on things at the supermarket. You can just scan them and work out what the price of a particular thing that you're interested in buying might be. It's the same with this. We sequence the DNA and we can tell what animal was at our field site. And we actually call this DNA barcoding. Now, there's lots of different animals that feed on blood and you might think that they'd all be really good uh, DNA collectors for us, but it turns out that leeches are particularly good, right? And a lot of that comes down to the way that they feed. So many leech species are opportunistic feeders. They just like sit and they wait and they hang out, they wait for an animal to come past and then they're like, yep, here's my next lunch. But if you're gonna adopt that kind of feeding strategy, you can't be too picky, right? So these feeders, these, these leeches kind of feed on whatever's going past. And that's good for us, right? Because if they're feeding on a wide range of animals and that's a wide range of animals that we can detect at our field site. That strategy also means that leeches tend to preserve blood meals for a long period of time. We can sequence animal DNA for four months after a leech fed on the animal, right? And that makes sense too when you think about this feeding strategy. If you've got a leech that's sitting there waiting for its next meal to come past, it might be waiting there for a while. And so if it digests its blood meal slowly, then it gives it time to get another, another meal, you know, some months down the track. And the other thing about kind of being an opportunistic feeder is that it means that leeches are really easy for us to collect, right? Because from a leech's point of view, we're just lunch. So you don't need to go find leeches. The leeches will find you. So this is what we did. We went out and teamed up with the forestry rangers in the Isla Shan National Park, and we asked them to collect leeches for us. What we did was really simple. We just, you can see some of our collaborators in China here. They just gave each of the rangers these little hip packs filled with little plastic tubes and said, give us as many leeches as you can give us. And they did not disappoint. They just literally pull them off their legs and they stick them into the tubes for us. And in three months, we got over 30,000 leeches. And let's get this out of the way too, 95% of them had human DNA in them. But even though we had so many leeches, we know exactly where each one came from because each ranger goes out and patrols a particular part of the park, right? You can see in the map that I'm showing you over on the right here, how the park is split up into little ranger patrol areas. Anyway, we sequenced all the DNA barcodes and as we hoped, we got a lot of vertebrate uh, animal biodiversity here, right? So we saw birds like this pheasant or this flycatcher. We saw amphibians, so like this, this spiny toad. We saw small mammals like this gymnur. And these small animals actually were really cool because you often don't get them in, in camera traps. Camera traps tend to work well for larger things, but we saw plenty of larger things too. Things like this muntjac deer up in the top right, this leopard cat, you know, this, this, this black bear. 
many of these species are pretty common, but we actually, some of them were not, right? So this, this pheasant, this toad, this black bear, they're all like endangered or like the threatened or near threatened species. So it was really cool to see them um, at, at our field site. But we also saw a lot of domesticated animals in the park. We saw cows, we saw sheep, we saw goats. Anyway, because we knew where each ranger was working, we could tell where in the park each of these animals was being found. So if we consider, for example, that muntjac deer. So I've shown you here on the map where we think the muntjac are hanging out in the park. These lighter colored areas are the areas where, the, where we think the muntjacs are. And these darker areas, not so much muntjac. And so what you can see here is that this species of deer tends to be found up here in the northern part of the park at lower elevations. And it also tends to be found down here in the south of the park, especially along the edges. So contrast that with the leopard cat, right? So this leopard cat tends not to be found up here in the north of the park. It tends to be found down here in the south, but in the middle of the park and not towards the edges. So I could go through all the different species like this, but instead, let me give you an overall picture. So instead of showing an individual species, let me show you a map that just shows how many species in total we saw in each area. Right? So these lighter colored areas, the areas with more species, and these darker colored areas, the areas with fewer species. Right? So what we're seeing is that those areas in the south, in the middle of the park at higher elevations, that's where lots of species are. Right? Not so much down here at lower elevations and towards the park edges. But not only do those areas at the mountaintops have more species, they have different species. So if we think of those mountaintop sort of, you know, middle of the park locations as being more protected, right? So I already told you that that's where we saw things like the leopard cat. It's also where we saw most of the birds. It's where we saw most of the small and the large mammals. On the other hand, these less protected areas across the edge of the park and down at lower elevations, that's where we were seeing the domesticated animals, the cows, the sheep, the goats. And I already showed you that that's where the muntjac were, was. We also saw other animals down there in these light, light, less protected areas, Himalayan field rats, this dark-tailed tree rat. Anyway, if I take a step back from all of this, what does it tell us? So what this tells us is that this protected area is working. There are lots of species here and some of them are rare and threatened and they're all there inside this park. But it's also saying that there's some room for improvement, right? So if we could keep out some of these domesticated areas from the park, uh, domesticated animals from the park, we might just hope that some of these other animals that are currently restricted to the mountaintops would be found all the way through the nature reserve. More generally though, so remember we set out to survey animal biodiversity across this large nature reserve using DNA from blood feeding leeches. And what we've shown is that this is a technique that is feasible on a scale that actually makes it practical as a real world conservation tool. Thank you, that was so cool. Okay, so we've got three questions. I'm gonna set a timer for 30 seconds because uh, this is rapid fire uh, questions. The first question is, uh, how do you fund this kind of research? Yeah, so this, there's actually a reasonable amount of funding around for this kind of thing. This, this was funded by um, the Harvard Global Institute, which was to set up, set up to um, foster collaboration between scientists in China and scientists uh, here in the US. Awesome. Very good, succinct answer. Next question. Um, do leeches prefer to grab and uh, eat from animals with bare and thin skins? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, we, we saw, that's a great question. Um, certainly leeches have preferences for different animals. Um, one of the things that I didn't talk about is there's a lot of complicated statistical modeling to account for differences in the rate at which leeches feed on different animals. Great. Um, next question, do leeches normally live in puddles and are you then missing out on animals that don't like to hang out in water at all? Yeah, so like I said, there's lots of different species. I think there's something like 600 different species of, of leech and the, the different leeches live in different places. Um, it's certainly possible that if we collected leeches from different places, we would find di a different array of animals. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. That was really cool. cool. All right, next up, we've got Abby.
You're muted, Abby, you're muted. It's May 12th, 2025. You wake up in the morning, snooze your alarm, and grab your phone to check the weather forecast. On the forecast, you can see that it's supposed to be warm and cloudy with a high chance of mosquitoes until 3 p.m. How might that information affect how you go about your day? Hi, my name is Abby Lewis, and I believe that ecological forecasting, so these sorts of forecasts that give us information about living things and their environment, can be used to save human lives and protect natural ecosystems. Today, I'm going to be talking about some of the work that I do to use ecological forecasting and try and provide safer drinking water for people around the world. But before I get into any of that, I wanna take a moment and thank all of my wonderful collaborators at Virginia Tech, um, funding sources, and the Western Virginia Water Authority for allowing us to do research in their beautiful reservoirs. So I wanna start off with a story. In 1861, Admiral Robert Fitzroy developed the first modern numerical weather forecast. His forecasts were designed primarily to stop shipwrecks off the coast of England, but he figured he might as well pass it on to the newspapers as well for public use. The forecasts immediately became wildly popular and they were used for all sorts of 19th century British event planning. But unfortunately, they were not exceptionally accurate and Admiral Fitzroy suffered a constant barrage of ridicule and criticism for his forecasts. I especially like this quote from a newspaper called The Age, which talks about how all of his uh, horse racing fans would check Fitzroy's forecast ahead of the Derby, and they were overjoyed to see a forecast for wind and rain, which, quote, of course indicated that it would be a remarkably fine day and the umbrellas might be left behind. So since that point, we have made incredible progress in forecasting the weather. Today's five-day temperature forecast is accurate about 90% of the time. That's similar to the accuracy of predicting the weather the very next day, less than 50 years ago. Now, I believe we have the power to go one step further. Improvements in weather forecasting combined with other scientific advances are opening up an entirely new discipline that uses um, those weather forecasts to predict changes in entire ecosystems. By understanding the weather, we can start to understand and predict all of these other things that depend on the weather, like bird migration, mosquito populations, or crop diseases. That understanding has the power to transform how we interact with the world around us. For example, if you had access to that mosquito forecast that I was talking about at the beginning, maybe you could make the decision to wear long pants, you could wear insect repellent, and in doing so, you could dramatically reduce your risk of getting mosquito-borne diseases. Um, likewise, farmers could potentially use highly accurate predictions of crop pests to target pesticide use to those times, um, thereby ensuring safe food production and also reducing pesticide-based pollution. So um, because this is such a new uh, emerging field, many of the possibilities for ecological forecasting likely can't even be imagined yet. As one example of this emerging field, I wanna take a minute and talk a bit about some of the work that I do to try and predict oxygen concentrations in drinking water reservoirs and lakes two weeks into the future. The motivation for this project is that oxygen concentrations play a really critical role in determining a bunch of different aspects of water quality. For example, fish need oxygen to survive, and when there's very low oxygen concentrations, the fish will literally suffocate, float to the surface, and you get these massive fish kills like the one shown in this picture. Likewise, if you have really low levels of oxygen, um, toxic metals can accumulate in that water and you can get accumulation of nutrients that cause harmful algal blooms like the one shown here. If managers had access to that information ahead of time that these water quality problems might happen, they could take steps to prepare for these problems or even prevent them. For example, drinking water managers might be able to prepare filters that can remove metals from the water, or a lot of drinking water reservoirs are equipped with systems that can pump oxygen gas into the bottom of the reservoir and get rid of these problems. So there's a lot of information we already know about oxygen concentrations in water. We know that oxygen gets used up as a result of biological processes that consume oxygen. And what I mean by that is um, you, when you breathe in, you use up a lot of oxygen and then you breathe out more carbon dioxide. And the same thing is happening in lakes and reservoirs, except it's primarily done by these little guys 
um, called microbes or just microscopic organisms. We also know that this process depends on a couple of different factors. So at high temperatures, um, that oxygen will get used up faster. The rate of change in oxygen concentration will be greater. Um, and likewise, if there's a lot of oxygen in the water to begin with, so this is a little symbol for oxygen, if there's a lot of oxygen to begin with, that rate will also be higher than if there was only a little bit of oxygen. So now that you have sort of a basic understanding of how my model works, let's take a look at what it actually looks like. So this is an interactive system that I developed that hopefully could be used by managers to visualize how oxygen concentrations may change in the future, and then they can take steps to um, adapt to that situation. Uh, in this figure on the right here, the x-axis or the horizontal axis is showing the date over the course of the summer in 2019. And the y-axis or the vertical axis is showing the amount of oxygen in the bottom waters of that lake. Right here, you can see uh, oxygen concentrations are decreasing. And that is a result of those biological processes that I was talking about that use up that oxygen. And then right at the day of this forecast, so the vertical line is marking the day of the forecast, oxygen start concentrations start to increase. And that's because managers started pumping oxygen gas into the bottom of this reservoir. And in this figure, my model is the black and gray lines, whereas the points here are the observations. So red points are observations that already happened, and the model gets that data to help it make future predictions. And any points past this vertical line are those forecasts. Um, and then you can see that the blue dots are put here to compare the forecasts to the observations, but the model didn't actually see those because they haven't happened yet. Um, a really important point that I want to make here is about these gray lines. So each gray line represents one possible future outcome. And this is, I think this is a really important point about forecasting in general, that when you're forecasting, the goal isn't to be 100% certain. It's not to achieve certainty, but it's to achieve the exact correct amount of uncertainty. What I mean by that is that there are just a lot of things in ecological systems that we can't be 100% certain about. We don't know whether a storm might happen next week that might mix oxygen into the water or whether um, our observations are even perfect. And we certainly don't know that this is a perfect model. So if we were to only show one of those lines, that would be misleading because it makes it seem like that's exactly what's going to happen. You can think of this a lot like weather forecasts. If you were to get a forecast for a 25% chance of rain, you'll interpret that differently than if the forecast just said, nope, it's not going to rain. Even though with a 25% chance of rain, it's most likely that it won't rain. Um, I think this is especially critical right now, as forecasts have been in the, lot, in the news a lot recently, as we're all trying to respond to the global threat of coronavirus. As you're looking at those forecasts this week, see if you can pay attention to their depiction of uncertainty. Do they show a range of possible outcomes? Where does that uncertainty come from? And how does it affect your interpretation of the forecast? In my model, those lines are also really important to how the model learns over time. So I said each of those represents kind of a different model, a different set of equations. And every time you see an observation, it can test which of those equations is doing, right, doing the best. And then it adjusts the other models to be more similar to that one that was doing well. You can kind of see this um, towards the end of the summer here, as there's, there's a lot of spread up until you get to an observation. This is also a really critical point when we're thinking about coronavirus forecasts, because um, models aren't static. They're constantly changing and learning over time. And you've probably seen coronavirus forecasts change a lot over the past several weeks. Part of that is because of changing regulations and human factors. But another important part of that is that the models are improving as we get more data that can help predict the future. So as you can see in this study, ecological forecasts can be used to provide fairly accurate predictions of the future conditions in an ecosystem several weeks into the future. And these forecasts are only getting better over time. As more forecasts are made and they're made more broadly accessible, Ecological forecasts have the power to transform the way we interact with the natural world. When Admiral Robert Fitzroy made the first weather forecast in 1861, there was no way to predict that 
weather forecasting would develop into the multi-billion dollar highly automated industry that it is today. I can't wait to see what developments in ecological forecasting are waiting beyond our wildest dreams. Thank you so much and I'm excited to take questions. Thank you, that was awesome. Okay, so uh, we have a question here. In the future, do you think that there will be more or less oxygen concentration? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there is actually kind of a global trend that oxygen concentrations in lakes and reservoirs are decreasing over time. And that's because of a bunch of different factors, but one of them is um, nutrient pollution that causes more algae to grow in the lake and that algae falls to the bottom where it decomposes. Those microbes eat all the uh, dead algae, use up a bunch of oxygen. Um, and so there's this kind of global pattern of decreasing oxygen concentrations. Great question. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question, what do you feed to the computer for building the models? Um, is this data measured from the field? Yeah, sweet. Um, it is, it is measured in the field. We do profiles in the lake, so we'll go out um, on a boat or a catwalk and you measure um, oxygen concentrations, but we also measure temperature. Um, and this model actually only uses those profiles that we do two times per week. And that's really exciting because these are pretty standard profiles that people do in a lot of different lakes around the world. And so hopefully this could be a system that can be adapted to those other places. Awesome, and last question. Um, does the lack of oxygen and pollution only kill fish or does it kill other animals too? Yeah, it can definitely kill other animals. So pretty much all animals depend on oxygen for life. So anything that needs oxygen to survive is not gonna do too hot when there's no oxygen available. Great. So can totally affect other things. Thank you so much. Where can we find you on the internet? <laughs> Great question. Um, I'm on Twitter at Lewis underscore Lakes. Awesome. I would love to chat about it more. Very good. And, and while I'm asking this question, uh, Chris, where can we find you on social media? Is Chris still here? Yeah. Oh, yep, sorry. I'm uh, at bakerccm.github.io. Could you say that one more time? Yeah, do you want me to put it in the chat? Uh, we don't have a chat because, uh, because we don't, but I'll post it on our, um, our Twitter account. Yeah, sure. Great, okay. Thank you so much, Abby, that was awesome. Um, next up, we've got Maud. Yes, and I'm going to share my screen here and see if it can work. All right, so here we go. Um, so, hi, my name is Maud, and since I'm um, as high as four apples, um, I'm passionate about nature, and I devote a lot of my life and my career to protect and save natural ecosystems. Um, so, I started my career looking at um, the DNA of a lot of different threatened species, to understand their um, evolution and participate to develop protection and conservation plans for them. And for example, I worked on the giant tortoises in Galapagos. So across the globe, projects trying to protect those species like the tortoises and many others have, been, have seen those threatened species thrive again and um, so it is really encouraging, but you know the conservation community recognizes that we're still short against this harm race against biodiversity crisis, and so we think that we not only need to change the behavior of our societies and need to protect those um, natural ecosystems, but we also need to be innovative and come up with new methods and new technologies. And one of the current emerging technologies that could help, but it's still very controversial, is gene editing. The fact of modifying the DNA of species. And it's pending because we still need to learn a lot and to discuss about it on whether, how, and when we could use gene editing in conservation. 
So now I'll spend the few minutes I have to explain why gene editing, our vision for its use, and then where we can get some of the wisdom that we can use to tailor gene editing for conservation. Um, gene editing is exploding in research. It's really helping a lot experimentation in the labs, especially in the public health space because of something that you may have heard, which is CRISPR. This acronym that describe of, uh, of a family of molecules that um, can be harnessed by bioengineers and molecu molecular biologists to be used as a scalpel to very precisely edit the DNA of a cell. And that is what we're considering in conservation at the moment. And um, the problem is that, well, it's not a problem, but um, is that thinking about it for conservation actually means that we're not going to modify the DNA of individuals in a lab, but we're going to do it for individuals in the wild. And that is very exciting, but it's also very scary because modifying a few individuals in the wild, they are going to be interacting with other individuals of that same species. And that is species is interacting with other species. It's going to impact entire ecosystem. It's going to impact our shared environment. No matter geopolitical or cultural borders, so that has a lot of implications and um, it's, it's, it's a lot of what we have to discuss right now. So in gene editing, you can consider, um, uh, in conservation, we can consider gene editing for different areas. And I'm going to focus now on one problem, which is the management of invasive species. Those species, who have been, which have been, that used like the human um, voyagers and uh, activities to cross ocean, cross um, continents, and they thrive everywhere. One example is, um, are the mice and rats that you can see everywhere now, and that therefore represent problems so much that they are thriving so much. They represent problems for crops, for public health because they can transmit diseases, um, for infrastructure and for conservation because they can feed on native species in their own habitats and they can drive them to extinction. My work is really at the intersection of these circles of research and work on, in the ground. And um, so when we consider gene editing um, for conservation and for the management of invasive species, we have two approaches that we can use. Either you want to boost the native species to react against the invasive one. And for example, there are trees essential to ecosystems that are um, threatened by invasive fungi. So we could help them and allow them to synthesize some, some fungicides to, um, to react and to resist against those invasive fungi. Or the other way around, and we could work on the invasive species so that we stop their spread and reduce their populations. And that's that second strategy that the team that I joined at the Media Lab is working on and I'm helping them for the reduction of, for the regulation of population of mice and rats. And I'm looking at the um, ecological and ecosystem angles to try to find how it could be limited in space and time. Remember that uh, problem of geopolitical and ecological borders, like human-made borders as well. So we really need to be, to have it confined to a specific place. Um, because you see, 
Rats and mice, they are amazing social creatures. They have feelings. We owe them so much. A lot of what we know on us humans today, it's thanks to a lot of experiments that we do on mice and rats in the labs. But there's still so much of a problem in conservation. They're feeding on everything. They eat lizards, birds, flowers, plants, eggs, um, fruits, everything. And they really threaten ecosystems. But the, the, the methods that we, do, that we have now to control their populations are really not humane. They are costly. They, are, they would be failing in many places. So we want to pro propose an alternative that is more humane. And that could help really by releasing a few engineered individuals to reduce their population and let the native species thrive again and save some native ecosystems. And this would even mean that we could protect some sacred species and um, local cultures, human cultures. So we've started to discuss with some communities where our technology could actually help save those sacred species. And um, now I think you can really understand that it's not only the work of some bioengineers in their lab constructing the technology. I myself am navigating among bioengineers and um, social scientists, revising my own background uh, in science to understand the ecosystem, how they work. And so it's really a multidisciplinary um, approach where we try to be as transparent as possible to have those conversations with the communities. And, um, but it's also, we also have to have a work that is cross-cultural because um, we're working and building trusted relationship with indigenous communities where we could save those sacred species and you know, indigenous wisdom brings us a more holistic vision, a vision centered on the um, quality of this human environment relationship that, um, that is more holistic than what, I can, what we can see with the science. And it, those conversations have already been shaping the development of the technologies but um, and 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 um, and that's really what we want is that we want it for a safer and more respectful and more responsive technology. Now, from this talk, what I would like you to take um, is that it's going to be a technology that we can use in places where there are no other solutions and. Um, that is going to be limited in time and space and really tailored to a very specific species, a very specific receiving ecosystem and community. So it's really a case by case approach. And um, one important aspect is that it's not a silver bullet at all. We still need to work on the source of the problems Re reorganizing our societies and our behavior, our consumption. And um, finally, the pandemic is there also to remind us that the future is not just an older version of today. It's going to be with new challenges, new diseases, um, a rising sea, changing climates, more people on the planet to take care of, new economies and interests. So I don't want to close the door to a technology just because it is scary. You see, the, the choice of um, using gene editing and conservation is going to have a very huge impact on the ecosystem. But so will the decision of not using it. So it's really giving us some food for thoughts. 
and I would be happy to take some questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Maud. Um, okay, we've got a lot of questions here, but we're gonna limit it to three. So the first question is, what do you tell people who reject gene editing altogether because of the unknowns and that we don't know the long-term effects yet? Well, I, I really accept the, the fact that they reject it, uh, but I really tell them that we are actually working on getting more information and um, it's not, the technology is really not ready. Um, so we're still really working on it. And again, like I'm telling them, we really need to be um, working on things that are going to be preventing biodiversity crisis in many, many years. So it's really a long-term approach. Awesome, thank you. Um, is there a regulatory body that currently is or will be governing what changes are okay to introduce? Yeah, well, so we're working a lot on that uh, because actually there is not nothing very specific to, to gene editing, um, especially in conservation. And so we're really working on guidelines and having some important NGOs and organisms to really respond to this need of regulation and, uh, and help in guiding uh, researchers really having that support and being careful, yes. Great, thanks. And last question, um, can you walk us through one specific change that you could make in an animal that would make it uh, less of a problem? Yeah, so for example, for those uh, rats and mice, we actually are thinking about limiting, um, or I mean, introducing a few males that um, would mate with wild females, and these females would therefore only have sons and their sons would only have sons. So the idea is that we would just limit the number of females in the population, and so that we limit the reproduction, the, yeah, the reproductive ability of the population for the population to actually not grow anymore. Great, okay. Well, thank you so much. Do you have anything that you wanna plug or places that you want us to find you on the internet? Um, I think that uh, on my screen, it was over there. Um, should I share my screen for a little bit or? Just for a moment, yes, that would be great. Here, I think this is this one. Perfect, all right. Voila, thank so you. Write that down. All right, thank you so much. Um, our next up is going to be Caitlin. Hi everybody. Uh, I'm Caitlin, and I'm a conservation biologist who works in cities, which sometimes throws people off because we're used to thinking about conservation as something that happens far away from people in places like rainforests and mountains and other wild and wonderful places. In cities, well, those are concrete jungles. They're places for people. But this divide has never really worked well for me because cities are so full of life, even if you do have to look a little harder for it than if you were in the rainforest. And the nature in cities, it matters, and it needs to be included in conservation. Conservation is something that can and should happen everywhere, even in our own backyards. In my research, I think about cities through the eyes of wildlife. Before our cities were built, wildlife were able to move freely across the landscape, but the development of cities has really restricted how they can move around. In my research, I work to think about how we can make it easier for wildlife to move across cities. I think about questions like, how can the deer cross the road? And how can the park down the street for me be better designed to support songbirds? Because of these types of questions, I spend a lot of time thinking about green spaces, places like parks, cemeteries, and pieces of forest around the city. But today I'm gonna to be talking to you about one specific type of green space, our lawns, which are unique because of their size. They're some of the smallest green spaces in cities, and they're almost always on private land unlike most city green spaces, which tend to be public spaces. Across any city, there are thousands of lawns. There's one in front of nearly every home. But have you ever thought about why we have lawns or where they came from? The first lawns were grassy fields around English and French castles in the 1500s. Castle grounds had to be kept clear of trees so that the soldiers protecting them had a clear view of their surroundings. Allowing enemies to sneak up on the castle through the forest just wasn't a very good idea. But maintaining a lawn was hard work. Remember that they didn't have lawnmowers back then, so it was all done by hand using scissors and skice. 
and most people couldn't afford to maintain any land that didn't produce food or something else that would somehow contribute to their livelihood. So for hundreds of years, a lawn was something that only very rich people could have. And believe it or not, but lawns were kind of like sports cars or fancy purses are today. Rich people would use them to impress their friends and let the world know that they had some serious cash. The average person wasn't able to have a lawn until after World War II, which is when lawns became com a common part of our cities. But even though all people of all walks of life now have lawns, they're still a bit of a status symbol. Neighbors will often judge each other based on how their front lawns look. A well-maintained lawn means a well-run, hard-working household, and overgrown, unkept lawns can be a sign of a lazy homeowner. And sometimes these standards are even enforced by homeowner associations and municipal bylaws. Of course, there's a lot of racist and classist undertones to this, but that's a talk for another day. So let's talk about the lawns themselves. Most plants grow from the top, but grasses actually grow from the bottom, which is a really great strategy if you're a plant that's evolved to deal with animals that will come by to eat a particular patch every few months or so, and then take off, take off the top part of the plant and then go on about their daily business. But most people mow their lawns a lot more often than that. So what happens is that instead of sending the roots downward into the soil like they normally would, the grasses in our lawn send their roots outwards to try and put up another blade that will somehow escape the teeth of the animals chowing down on them. But lawn mowers are a lot more efficient than animal teeth and hardly ever leave a blade of grass uncut. This means that the grasses of our lawns are under constant stress, so it takes a lot of work and resources to keep them looking good. To help with this, a lot of people will use fertilizers and pesticides on their lawn, but these often contain a lot of harmful chemicals that can make wildlife or small children really sick if they end up eating them. These chemicals can also end up in water, harming the drinking water of both people and animals. But one of the biggest environmental problems about lawns is how much water they use. In the United States, lawns are actually the largest irrigated crop, and more water is used on them than all of the wheat and corn that's grown in the country combined. And unlike crops, most of the water that ends up on lawns is potable. It's clean drinking water. Across North America, about a third of our drinking water ends up on lawns, and depending on where you live, this can be as high as 80%. Think about that for a second. Picture filling three glasses of water from your tap, now dump one or two of them out on your front lawn. It seems kind of silly when you think about it that way, doesn't it? And for all of the resources that we put into lawns, ecologically speaking, there aren't a lot of benefits to them. While lawns are better for wildlife than say a parking lot, turf grass doesn't produce any seeds, nectar, or fruit, so its ability to support wildlife is pretty limited. But it doesn't have to be this way. At the bare minimum, we need to mow our lawns a lot less and leave the clippings wherever they fall so that they can act as a chemical-free fertilizer and shelter for some creatures like insects. Mowing less also gives other plants like dandelions and clovers a better chance to grow. These so-called weeds are food for a lot of different animals, especially bees and other insects. And more of them means more birds, frogs, and small mammals throughout the city. It can be pretty simple too. Research has shown that by switching to mowing your lawn every other week instead of every single week, can double the diversity of plants and bees. That's right, it can actually be better for the environment for you to do less work. And to go even further and help nature in the city, you can work to replace your grass lawn with other plants. A good place to start is to pick a low maintenance flowering plant, something like clover. It's easy to grow and you're probably familiar with it because it's a pretty common weed on our lawns. And if you've ever tried to get rid of clover, you know how hardy it is, so why not just give in to it? Plus, clover is like a natural fertilizer because it fixes nitrogen in the soil. And as a bonus, its flowers are the favorite food of a number of different bee species. And once you have a good base, you can start to add other kinds of plants, like shrubs and flowers, which will provide seeds and other food, as well as shelter for a variety of wildlife. The key is to think about what kind of plants work best for your climate. If you're somewhere hot and dry, you're going to need different plants than what I would need here in the wet coastal climate of the Maritimes. Plus, plants that are adapted to your local climate are a lot easier to maintain. They probably don't need to be watered or fertilized, so they'll be much better for the environment than the typical water-hungry lawns we're used to. Plus, if you get away from grass, you won't ever have to touch a lawnmower again. By replacing lawns with native plants, we can help create a home for wildlife in the city. And the more of them there are, the better. 
Because each lawn is pretty small, the real power in natural lawns is in numbers. The more of them there are, the easier it is for wildlife to move around the city. Right now, there might be really good places for a rabbit on either end of a neighborhood, say a small patch of forest on one side and a park on the other. But when he tries to move across the neighborhood, the rabbit will find himself in quite the obstacle course. There are busy streets with cars to worry about, nowhere to hide from dogs that might chase him, and nowhere to stop for a snack or take a nap. When our lawns have a lot of different plants on them instead of just grass, it helps the rabbit and other wildlife move across our neighborhoods. It makes it easier and safer for them to move, plus it can give them a place to take shelter or have something to eat along the way. Now, even though there are a lot of environmental issues with lawns and a lot of benefits to the alternatives, getting people to switch to a more natural lawn can be surprisingly difficult. These conversations usually start out really well. People are generally really excited about the idea of having a more environmentally friendly lawn, but then it really quickly turns to fears about having a messy property or making their neighbors mad. So if that's you, let me try and assure you that ditching your grass lawn is actually a really good idea. First of all, a natural lawn doesn't have to look messy or unkept. They can actually be pretty nice. And as for what your neighbors might think, I'll let you in on a little dirty secret. Surveys have shown that up to three quarters of people would prefer to have a more natural lawn. They just won't do it because they're too scared of what their neighbors might think. So chances are, if you're curious about changing your lawn, so are your neighbors. The perfect green lawn is a fixture of our cities today, but it doesn't have to have a place in the cities of tomorrow. With climate change a real threat, we need to think about how to create more resilient cities. And right now, lawns are contributing much more to climate change than they're helping. We pour a lot of resources into maintaining something that doesn't do a lot of good. It was originally created to make it easier to spot invading armies and help rich white people impress their friends. So it's time to change what we value from our lawns. It's time to think about our cities, uh, what they could be without lawns, and to start creating spaces that are truly green in front of our homes. Thank you, and I'd love to take some questions. Thank you very much. Okay, we have lots of questions here as well. Um, our first question, given water and pesticide usage and biodiversity concerns, what's a better option? A manicured monoculture or an artificial turf lawn? Oh, that's a good question. And uh, one that I definitely struggle with. And I think I would still go um, with the actual plants um, only because there are a handful of wildlife species that can use them, um, unlike plastic, which is virtually nothing. Awesome. Um, Let's see, Tina wants to know, how have, uh, or have you researched the impact of replacing lawns with gardens? Uh, I haven't done that myself. So it's something that I'm really interested in looking at in the future. Um, I think there's a lot of links to the local food movement and food security that um, our lawns could definitely be contributing to. Great. And so last question. Your work is obviously very relevant for a lot of people that aren't scientists at all. And so how do you go about communicating your research with the public? I do stuff like this. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, I try and talk to as many people as possible. Um, yeah, Twitter can be really great as well. Um, yeah, really any way that people will not tell me to stop talking, I will just keep talking. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, Twitter. Uh, my handle is uh, Kate, C-A-I-T-L, uh, Cunningham. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Thanks for sharing your work. Okay, Stacy. Hello. Hello. Greetings from England. Right. Let me see if I can share my screen with you guys. Uh, going all right you guys can see that okay you're not seeing my presenter view or are you uh we see how to make Just... a mountain on one side and then the next slide on the other uh, one okay let me swap that there we go that's better beautiful all right so hi everybody um my name is stacy and i have a confession i think that rocks are fabulous. 
Now, I would say that because I'm a geologist, which means I study rocks and the solid parts of our earth. And before you think that I'm crazy and you, you don't believe me, I'm going to give you three reasons why rocks are fabulous. And the first reason that rocks are fabulous is because they're really important to everybody. Any material that we need for modern day life, if it can't be grown, then it has to be dug out of the ground. The computers that you're using now, your phones, every part of our society relies on metals and elements that are found in the earth. So understanding where we can find those elements is super important. The second reason why rocks are fabulous is because they have allowed me to travel all over the world. All of these images that you're seeing here are photos that I've taken on my geological travels. They're from Scotland, Spain, the Alps, Greece, Canada, California, all places that I've been lucky enough to visit as a geologist. But saving the best reason to last, the really fabulous thing about rocks is that they tell us stories, stories about the history of our earth how it formed and how it's changed over the last four and a half billion years. You've just got to know how to read them. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you today about my PhD work, which uh, I think involves looking at the most stunning of geological features, mountains. These towering blocks of rock that rise up above the surrounding landscape. I've always wondered why are they there? How did they become so high? What are they made of? Well, to answer those types of questions, I have to take you back in time to around 70 million years ago. Back then, the dinosaurs were just about to learn about meteorites and unfortunately meet their demise. And India was not where it is today. It was south of the equator and it was about to begin on a great journey. So about 70 million years ago, India started moving northwards. It moved past the equator and it caused what was known as the Tethys Ocean to start to close up. And by about 50 million years, it had crashed into the huge landmass of Eurasia. It didn't stop India. India slowed down a little bit, but it kept on moving northwards. And all that sediment that was in the Tethys Ocean between the two continents got caught up in the collision and was forced upwards higher and higher. And it's still rising today. They're the rocks that form the greatest mountain range on Earth, the Himalayas home of the Red Panda, the Sherpa people, and the tallest mountain on Earth, Mount Everest. And did you know that the rocks that are at uh, the summit of Mount Everest, 8,848 meters high above the world, are made of a rock called limestone, a rock that forms at the bottom of the ocean, a rock that contains marine fossils. So how do you move all of this rock from the very bottom of the sea floor to the top of the earth? Well, it turns out that the key to understanding how you make a mountain is actually understanding how you melt a mountain. So you see there, I was talking about all the cool rocks that are at the top of the mountains and yeah, they're, they're kind of interesting. But what I'm really interested in are the rocks that form that are found in the heart of the mountain belt. The rocks that get stuck underneath that big pile, underneath tens of kilometers worth of other rocks. So when those continents collide, all those sediments from the sea floor kind of got stacked on top of one another. And some rocks kind of got pushed up and other rocks ended up being stuck at the bottom of the pile where they started getting hotter and hotter and they got squeezed and deformed under all that weight and pressure of the overlying rocks. If you imagine scoring a game-winning goal for your sports team and everyone piles on top of you to celebrate, pretty soon that gets kind of uncomfortable, right? Well, what happens to a rock in this situation is that it changes, it adapts, it grows new minerals to fit in with these changing conditions, these changing temperatures and pressures. And if you get the rocks really hot enough, they'll actually begin to melt. And as soon as you have molten rock in the middle of a mountain range, well, that's when the fun begins. Because melting a mountain range means that the mountains get weak and rocks can move around a bit more because they're more buoyant. If you think of a lava lamp, as the blobs heat up, they rise to the surface and they're driven up. And that's what happens uh, to mountain ranges. So if we really want to start moving rocks and get our mountains really, really high, we have to start melting the mountain. Now, understanding that process of how these rocks melt is one of the questions that I've been trying to answer in my PhD research. And to answer it, I had to go to the Himalayas to go and have a look for rocks that used to be molten. 
and I went to the country or the kingdom of Bhutan in the eastern Himalayas. It also happens to be the country with the best flag in the world. If you would admire the magnificent thunder dragon on the uh, flag of Bhutan there. And going to Bhutan was one of the most incredible things that I've ever had the privilege of doing. As I said before, I've traveled to a lot of countries doing geology, but going to Bhutan was amazing. The mountains and the wildlife were absolutely stunning. The people were amazing and lovely and the food was spicy. It was delicious, but it was very spicy. But I was there to work and remember I was hunting for these formerly molten rocks. And that's what you can see in this photo here. These white bits, this is a rock called granite. And it forms when you melt this kind of darker, grayer rock, and then you let it cool down so that it can grow its own new minerals. And these minerals are the individual kind of different colored parts that make up the rock as a whole. Now, one of the key minerals that I was searching for was this one here, this beautiful blue mineral here. And it's called kyanite, like cyan, the color blue. And kyanite is really special. Well, it's my favorite mineral, but I'm gonna convince you that it should be yours as well. Kyanite's really special because it only forms under really specific conditions when the pressures are really high, like they are in the heart of a mountain belt. So when I saw a kyanite in the field in a rock, that means that it's one of those rocks that was stuck at the bottom of that pile, right? Now, the cool thing about minerals is that when we're trying to understand the story of mountains and we're trying to read these rocks, it's these minerals that are keeping a diary of what happened. If we look at lots of different minerals, so it, like the mineral kyanite, we've also got a shiny silvery muscovite and this black shiny biotite. They all write down slightly different stories. They're all like different characters in a book. They've recorded slightly different parts of the story. They might have um, written down the story at different time periods. So in order to understand everything, I need to get the stories from each of those minerals and combine them together in order to write the biography of a mountain. So what I did was I took samples of these rocks and I put them on a ship and then three months later they arrived back in the UK where I was able to look at them in the lab. And in order to read the details of the diaries that these minerals had written, I needed to look at the chemical elements that make up the minerals. Elements like iron, silicon, aluminium, stuff like that. And to do that, I had to shoot lasers at the minerals. One of the coolest things about my project, I got to use lasers. So in this image here, each of these circles is a hole that I drilled into a kyanite grain uh, so that I can analyze the chemistry of that bit of rock. And each one of these circles is about half the width of a human hair. And on the image on the right here, I did even smaller spots and I did hundreds and hundreds of them, which allowed me to build up a picture of how the chemistry changes across a kyanite grain. And this is something that nobody's ever done with kyanite before. Everyone thought that kyanite was a really boring mineral and it didn't really have much to say in its diary. But I found that not to be the case. Kyanite's actually quite talkative. You just need to kind of warm it up a little bit and get talking to it. And so I created things like this map down here, which shows how the chemistry of the kyanite changes across the grain. And as a kyanite crystal grows, as it's being heated up, it kind of grows outwards from the inside and it grows like tree rings. And what this map shows here is that um, in these tree rings, we have different amounts of the element chromium. In some parts, we've kind of got low chromium and then on the edges, we've got this high chromium. And again, we didn't know that chromium varied like this in kyanite, so it's really cool. And so that was one of the stories I got from kyanite, but when I combined the stories of all of the different minerals together, these other chemical diaries, I found that as these rocks were forming and these mountains were growing, they were all, the minerals were swapping elements between themselves. Elements like chromium, vanadium, germanium, all these weird and wonderful elements that you probably never heard of before. They were all moving around between the muscovite, the kyanite and the molten rock. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, we didn't know this was happening. And if we want to understand where these elements are in our earth, we need to understand these processes. And the other really interesting thing that we found was that biotite didn't really get involved in this process just kind of sat there not doing anything 
minding its own business, didn't share any elements, didn't take anybody as elements, and that's absolutely fine. There's always one. And so I hope that I've convinced you um, that kind of in order to understand how mountain ranges form, that we need and we need to read the rocks and we need to read the minerals that are found within them. Because the chemical diaries that these minerals write during their lifetime tell us really detailed stories that I can then put back together to write the biography of a mountain. And hopefully I've convinced you that kyanite is the, uh, your new favourite mineral uh, as it is mine and it's much more interesting than you thought. You just got to talk to it a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I did not have a favorite mineral before, but now uh, I think I do because brilliant. Why not? Okay, great. <laughs> so, um, all right, got a couple questions for you. Um, can all rock melt, or can only a specific type of rock melt? So, there's some rocks that are easier to melt than others, and it's all to do with chemi chemical reactions, really. So, you need to have the right chemistry in order for a rock to melt. Um, but pretty much everything else, if you get it to a high enough temperature, it will melt, yeah. Awesome. Next question, what's the most complex rock formation you've ever seen? Oh my gosh. Um, uh, probably the rocks that I've been working on for my PhD, kind of geologists uh, think that my rocks are, are quite notorious because they're a mixture of the bits that did melt and the bits bits that didn't melt and there's all these chemical interactions going on and they're they're pretty complicated to work on um so yeah i accidentally fell into working on very complicated rocks on my phd great uh now we have uh, a question out of left field but uh very important and must be asked um we would like to know if you have uh any favorite rock puns oh oh my um oh i can't think of any rock puns now uh, don't take things for granted. Perfect. Wonderful. <laughs> so much. All right. If everybody would like to come back uh, and then you can tell us. So everybody, everybody being our scientists, um, turn your video on uh, and then we can wrap this up. Thank you everybody for sharing your science with us today. This was so great. Um, we are doing this again at 8 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be hearing from our other five scientists about a, a varying range of things. Um, is there anything, scientists, that you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? Thanks okay. so much for having us here. Yeah, this is a you. fantastic opportunity. Great. Thanks so much for being here. Um, okay, so yeah, we're meeting again at 8. Um, if you'd like to hear more about Skype a Scientist, we do all kinds of events all week long. And so you can find out more about that at skypeascientist.com under our live stream link. Um, we're doing trivia this Thursday night um, for adults. And otherwise, we'll see you right back here at 8. Thank you, everyone, for all of your questions um, and for joining us today. Thank Bye. Bye-bye. See you later.